You did, did, I didn't hear the broadcast is starting. Did you hit start broadcast? I did start broadcast. Uh, one second, people. <laughs> Let's double check. It's starting. She hears. Okay. We're good. Close, uh, let's get that out of the way so I don't see that. <clears throat> All right. Good morning, everybody. Sorry for that. Thank you for joining us today on our webinar Wednesdays. Uh, would you mind please typing in because we're having some issues. Nope. Chris is telling me we're good. All right. So we know our audio is good. Our camera is good. All right. <clears throat> so good morning. Thanks for joining us today. Today you're here for Understanding Low Voltage. My name is Jim De Palma. And with me running everything in the background is Rob Clemens. So he's running the computer. He actually has to advance the PowerPoint because we lost our remote. And he's going to be answering questions or asking questions from the, that we get from the audience. So on your computer, a couple of housekeeping things. If you're watching this on your computer, you should see a couple of hash marks that are, separate uh, myself from the PowerPoint itself. You can click on that and expand the PowerPoint as big as you want, make me totally disappear. If you want to make me bigger because you think I'm so good looking, you can do that too. All right. This way you can see it, uh, the PowerPoint as best as you can. You do have the uh, question uh, on the right hand side of your screen where you can type in any questions. We will answer them as we go. Uh, Rob will answer them, but if, the, if there's a good question where he feels the whole audience should know about, he will uh, interject and we will discuss it, all right? Uh, you also have the ability, if you're watching this on your computer, to take a screenshot, all right? Because there are no handouts today, but at the end of the presentation, I do give you a link to the Takeo um, Wiring Guide and also the two books by Carol Fay, which you should get. So you can take screenshots as we go along. This way you have what's on the screen. So you don't even really have to take notes. Just use the screenshot and then you can review them later. All right, so we're all good. Everybody can hear, camera's on, Robbie is ready. So please advance, Rob, let's go. Uh, advance, thank you. All right, so what we're doing today, our goal today is to make sure everybody understands what makes up our different circuits. And we're gonna concentrate on the low voltage side in our in our hydronic systems. All the parts and pieces that make up these circuits and how you will use them in order to control or operate the system that you're building and also to help you troubleshoot it when you're out there in the field. So as we do in our hydronic class, we do give you a couple of nuggets that as long as you remember this at the end of the day, you'll be in good shape. So this is the most important thing here. What do we need to make a complete circuit? And it works in threes. So if you know this, type it in. But Rob, if you wouldn't mind advancing, it's going to uh, be. Yes, before we do that, uh, Chris wanted to advise us that she did uh, upload the wiring guide, the Takeo catalog, the low voltage uh, zone valve wiring, uh, and all that into the handouts on the webinar. So they do have those available. All right, fantastic. So you do have all that information on the handouts. My bad. Could, could they hear me, though? That I'm not sure about. All right, so <laughs> we we. This is gonna be good, I promise. <laughs> We're just having some technical issues. So yes, you do have handouts today that you can download to take a wiring guide and some other notes from our presentation today. So either do your uh, downloads or take your screenshots as we move along. All right, so let's get moving here. So the three most important, the three things you need, I gave it away, the things you need to make a complete circuit and they come in threes. So first thing is, Rob, you got to click it. You got to pay attention here, baby. Just click it, click it, click it. We need, please, yep, we need power, we need switch, and we need a load. We need a load. All right, so what you're seeing on the screen, I need one more click there, Robbie. Sorry. Since we're going to concentrate on the low voltage side, our power is going to come from our transformer. So the transformer is what's going to take our line voltage and drop that down to low voltage, to 24 volts. The most common switch that you will play with in our systems will be a thermostat. But we have a lot of different switches within our system. 
uh, some that are going to turn things on and off, and a lot of them that are safety switches that we're going to have to deal with, especially when we're troubleshooting. And the most common load on a low voltage side would be our zone valve motor. But we will also be using the low voltage circuit to turn on line voltage loads. So please advance. So if you want to think of your three th most important things of power switch and load as a triangle, that's what's going to give you a completed circuit. And every circuit, whether it's line voltage or loan voltage, has to have power switch and load. So when I'm doing this in front of a, a, a live group, I always tell them I want you to tattoo this to the inside of your forearm. I want you to look at this at all times when you're out there troubleshooting especially. Power switch and load, power switch and load. Where's my power? What's my switch? Where's the load? All right, so Rob, if you would please advance. So in our world, a closed switch is what's going to complete the circuit. So we don't want you to think about... Uh, you know, switches as, as valves, as, as we think of them in our hydronic system. So here, a closed switch is going to complete our circuit. An open switch now breaks the circuit, cuts power from being completed. So if I've got an open switch, we break the circuit. Robbie, if you wouldn't mind, please. And if we have a closed switch, one more, please, we now complete the circuit. Okay, advance, please. All right, so our power is going to come from the transformer. So if you wouldn't mind, they either step up or step down. So what we're going to concentrate on today is the step down transformer. And they're rated in volt amps. So the most common one you'll play with is a 40 VA transformer. So how does this actually do, you know, how does it actually take line voltage and bring it down to low voltage? Well, in the center there, you see that black band, and that's actually a big piece of iron that's hollow in the middle, all right? So think of a rectangular square, if you want, and it's hollow in the middle. And I've got 500 windings on the primary side. And then on the secondary side, I have 100 windings. So it's a five to one ratio. And the windings actually don't touch the, uh, the iron. There's a film there, so they're around it, but they don't actually touch it. And what happens is we create electromagnetism. So what happens is on the primary side with the 500 windings, that's your 120 volts. The 100 windings is your secondary side. So if I took 120 and divided that by five, that's how I get 24. Hence, that's how I make 24 volts. So that's how that transformer is operating. Believe it or not, the heavier it feels in your hand, that would signify that's a really good transformer. But they're rated in volt amps, so you always have to make sure that you have the proper size transformer for the amount of volt amps you have to provide. And we'll go over that as we go on. Okay? So the most common is a 40 VA, as you can see there. And we're going to step down from 120 volts to 24 volts. So the next part that we want to look at, if you wouldn't mind advancing, please, are switches. All right, within our circuit, we've, we've identified where our power is coming from, but now we have to find our switches. And this is really pretty simple. Switches do what? They're going to turn things on. They're going to turn things off. Okay? So let's, let's decide if I do this, we're going to advance. <laughs> so when they turn things on, they turn things off. So the most common switch you're going to see is your thermostat. And how is that signified on our wiring diagrams and you're going to see right there you have what looks like two hash marks next to each other and that's considered what we call normally open and then the one below it the two hash marks with the line across it that is our normally closed what's really important here is the word normally that means that switch in that position is with no power so if i'm a normally open switch i'm sitting there patiently waiting to do something when power is applied, I will probably close. My normally closed switch is already closed, and I'm waiting patiently to do something, and when energized, will open. So that's how we're going to sequence items in our system. This is how we're going to turn things on and off, by either making it a normally open or normally closed switch. So the switches that we play with in our industry, and there's multiple different types of switches, but we're going to concentrate more on SPST, which is single pole, single throw, 
and DP, DT, double pole, double throw. So a single pole, single throw. How to, an easy way to explain this. I've got a fishing rod in my hand. And at the end of my line, instead of a hook, I've got a ball. And I cast it to Rob. Rob catches it. So that would be considered a single throw, all right? Single pole, single throw. Rob and I have really practiced, and I've got two fishing rods, and there's two balls at the end. I cast both at the same time. Robbie catches them. That's a double pole, double throw. And that's what we do in our industry. We have a lot of single pole and a lot of double pole switches out there. So this slide will show you what we would see in an ice cube relay. And that's it's a good visual as we move forward to explain double pole, double throw. So you'll see it's a double pole and they're both on normally closed. So both those switches are closed. And when I advance it, when I advance it, they're gonna both move at the same time to normally open, okay? So inside that ice cube relay, if you look really closely, you will see the two switches. You will see the normally closed switch, because the two contacts are right next to each other, they're right on top of each other, they're touching. And then I have the other contactor on top with that space in between. That's the normally open side. On the bottom, you see that wrap of copper. You see all that copper winding. And what that is right there, that is our load. So this shot shows you exactly with no power applied, the normally closed switch and the normally open switch. Now, if I apply power and I energize that copper winding, we're gonna create a magnet because the winding of the copper is around a piece of iron. We energize it, we make a magnet. Now, the normally closed switch is gonna open. The normally open switch is gonna close. We'll get that clap. And now we've turned something on. If you've been in the industry for a while, maybe you had an older mentor for a while, he may have said to you, hey kid, did you hear that? The relay pulled in, we hear that snap. And that's exactly what happened. The normally closed opened and the normally open closed. That's the relay pulling in. All right, so again, switches, they turn things on, they turn things off. We have different switches in our industry. We have thermostats, we have aquastats, we have humidistats, but there's other items in our system that have switches, all right? So if we have zone valves, within the zone valve itself, there is a switch, it's called the end switch. We power the zone valve, it's gonna open the valve, and in the process of opening the valve, it's going to close a switch, which will start the next sequence of power, switch, and load. Low water cutoffs, you see the green boxes, the green take all low water cutoffs at either 24 volts or 120 volts. Those are switches, those are safety switches, and they are normally closed. If they open, that's gonna cut power either to our gas valve or cut power to our whole system. So we have all different types of switches in our, in our systems, okay? So switches that control temperature are designed to open or close on either temperature rise or fall. Pretty simple, all right? So that could mean uh, my uh, thermostats, they're gonna close on temp fall, or that could mean an acrostat or a high limit will open on temperature rise. So what does that mean when we're looking at a wiring diagram? How, what kind of symbol am I gonna see for this? Well, you can see in the upper left, that's my normally open switch. On the upper right, that's my normally closed switch. Below them is another version of how they are drawn, and that may sometimes signify a, um, a pressure switch, depending on the item that you're working with. A lot of uh, power vented water heaters have pressure switches, a lot of boilers have them. The bottom on the left, which uh, just above what it says fuse, which looks like uh, a Picasso painting, that is what signifies a thermostat. So when I'm looking at a wiring diagram, first thing I'm gonna do is zero in on the low voltage side, find my power, find my switch. I'm gonna look for what is, you know, what's gonna be my thermostat? What is the main switch that's turning thing on? And that's what I'm going to see. And on the total uh, bottom left-hand side, what, what is drawn as a fuse, that is also a switch, and that is a normally closed switch. So you will see fuses in line with other switches because it's a safety and it's a normally closed switch. 
So, you know, please understand if we lose a fuse, if the fuse blows, the fuse opens, and now we break that circuit, yeah, we can change the fuse, but we have to figure out why we lost that fuse. All right? All right, so next in the power switch uh, and load category is loads. So loads use power, all right? They're gonna use the power to do some type of work. And we have all types of loads in our systems. So we have our relay coil. So looking in that ice cube relay, that coil is a very important load because that's gonna be a very important item. That's the bridge between our 24 volt and our line voltage loads. We've got the loads from our zone valve motors. Now, some of them are, uh, have a synchron motor in there. Some of them are heat motors, where we actually are heating up a pill of wax, which will expand and push a plunger down. So we have fast opening motors, slow opening motors, and another most common 20, 120 volt load would be our circulator motors, okay? So what do loads look like on a wiring diagram? Well, the top is a very simple uh, symbol for a load, but the second one from the top, the one that looks like a sideways Z, that signifies a relay coil. And that's really critical because on our wiring diagrams, wherever there's a relay coil, that's a very important load because addressed to that relay coil will be other switches. And if I energize that relay coil, I have switches both on the low voltage side and the line voltage side that will open and or close. And that's how we're gonna turn things on and off. That's what's gonna give us our sequence of operation. So now that we know what makes up the power, what makes up our switches and what makes up our loads, we start to build circuits. So we have two different types of circuits. We have circuits that are in series and circuits that are in parallel. So they're both used and loads are never in series. Loads are always separate, but switches usually are in series. So in our industry, we will have switches that turn the system on, but we'll have multiple switches in series in a row that act as safeties. And that could be the reason why we may have an issue uh, on a job where the, the equipment's not working. Maybe one of our safeties is open. We have to find it and find out why. So series means things are strung together in a row. And if you're older like me, before 1990, all right, your Christmas lights were in a row. And if we lost a bulb, we lost the whole string of lights. Now that doesn't happen. If we lose a bulb on a, a Christmas tree uh, lights, they're in parallel. We don't lose the whole string of lights. Okay? All right. So here's a really good diagram to show you uh, power switch and load and switches in series. So when you look at this diagram, you're gonna see dark line and that will always signify line voltage. When you're looking at a wiring diagram, darkly drawn lines are line voltage. And then you see our switches. So you see a service switch that is normally closed, a low water uh, cutoff normally closed. And then we see our T-stat, which right now is sitting there as normally open. And then further down the wiring is our burner. So that is our load. So L1, L2, my line voltage, that's my load. My switches, I've got switch, switch, switch in series. And then I've got my burner as my load. Type in and let Rob know, how do we turn that burner on? And there's two things that have to happen in order for that burner to turn on. So if you can, type it in, give you a second. And tell Rob, how do we turn that burner on? Any responses there, Rob? Not yet. Not yet. I got a hand raised. But, okay. Uh, they didn't type it into the uh, into the question box. Okay. Well, two things have to happen. Uh, we got one to energize the gas valve. Well, I'm asking how we're going to energize that burner. All right. All right. So we got one thermostat call. All right. So that's one part. What's the other part? Anybody? We need power. Well, yes, power is there. So the assumption is power is there. 
All right. So yes, we have to have the thermostat closed. So the thermostat's closing based on a temperature fall. But what else has to happen? Safety's closed. The safeties stay closed. The service switch stays closed, and the low water cutoff stays closed. So that service switch, that's at the top of the stairs, right? That's your little light switch, right? It looks like it, but it's got a red cover. That's got to stay closed or in the on position. And the low water cutoff, the probe has to stay surrounded by water and stay closed. If either one of those open, but still my thermostat closes, we will not power the burner. Very good. Very good. Okay, moving forward, Rob, please. Sure. Rob, are we having fun? Yeah. <laughs> I feel very Italian today talking with my hands, but I have no I have no clicker. This is very odd. So now we're in the boiler room. All right. So again, this is a zone valve system, and, and this is the common thing you're going to see in the boiler room. We're going to see our transformer, we will see a thermostat, and we will see a zone valve motor. So a very simple diagram here. There's my power, which is my thermos, uh, transformer. There is my switch, which is my thermostat. And the load is the zone valve motor. So a single zone, no big deal. All right, advance, please. Now, if I add a second zone, how did we wire it here? Well, we wired it in parallel because I'm sharing the same power as the first zone. But my second zone has its own switch and its own load. So we're both zones are sharing the same power, but they're completely different switches, completely different loads. Let's go to the next screen, please. And now we're showing you a three zone circuit. So again, three different zones, all sharing the same power, but each one gets its own switch and its own load. So they're in parallel. If the first zone, zone valve motor failed, it would not affect zone two or zone three. And the same thing if something happened on zone two or zone three, it would not affect the other two zones. But what's happening here now is all those wires that are connecting to the transformer, I don't have a lot of room there. So at this point with three wires, it's starting to get a little busy and it may not have enough room to make a good connection. Do you agree, Rob? All right, so on our next slide, what you're going to see out in the field is you're going to see wire nuts. What we're making is a pigtail from that wire nut to the transformer. And you can see on the right hand side of the screen, I'm taking all three zones and just wire nutting them together and then bringing one single wire to pick up power. And on the other wires coming from the zone valve motors, they're all wire nutted together and they're picking up the other side of the transformer. So if you're looking at the zone valves, I'll make this easy. And if you're thinking Honeywell, because they're the most common ones, the zone valve motor is two yellow wires. So the wire coming from the zone valve motor to the thermostat is a yellow wire. And then the combined second yellow wires from all three of those zone valve motors are wire nutted together. And then we're connected to the load. All right, so we're still in parallel. We're sharing the same load. We just used a pigtail to keep the wiring neater at the load, at the transformer, okay? And to me, that's usually the scariest thing to look at when I see a bird's nest of wires all down at the, uh, at the boiler. You know, which wire goes to where? This gets a little crazy, but I'm going to show you how we can clean that up. So if we go forward, Rob, please. So this is right out of a Honeywell manual, and this is showing, you know, three different zone valves showing the transformer, showing the thermostats, and how we're wired to our load, to our thermostats, and then also now taking the red wires off of those Honeywell zone valves, which are the end switch, and how they go to the TT on the Aquastat relay. So if we look at the incoming power, that's the dark drawn line, you see it going to our transformer, but you see two dots there. Those dots are going to signify wire nuts. And now I'm bringing power also, the same power, down to the terminals on the Aquastat relay. So I've got 120 volts going to my transformer, 120 volts going to my Aquastat relay. Then on the step down side of the transformer, my lightly drawn lines, there are, there's the low voltage wiring. And you'll see a, a bunch of dots there too. Again, that signifies wire nuts. But in reality, the first dot you see 
is the wire nut. So the second dot and the third thermostat, they're all wire nutted together at the first one. And the same thing with the yellow wire, combined yellow wires coming from the zone valves. They are wire nutted together at one. And then at the bottom, two reds coming out, you see the wire nut dots. They are technically wire nutted together at one wire nut and the other side's wire nutted together and another wire nut. And then we go down to TT on the boiler. I really wish I had my, <laughs> so I can really show this, but I'm trying to do my best. All right, next screen. So next screen here, we're showing you a very common scenario, especially if you're in New Jersey or in the New York area, uh, close to the inner cities where you'll see Honeywell zone valves and the Taco 570 series zone valve. And this really can create some confusion if you're not up to speed on what the Taco valve is. The Taco valve is a heat motor valve. So it's not a uh, mechanical motor, it's a heat motor. We have a wax pill and we surround it with copper wire. And when we energize the copper wire, it creates heat. The wax expands, it pushes a plunger down, opens the valve. Very slow open, very slow close. They're bulletproof, but in today's world, 90 seconds for it to open and close is an eternity. But guys will look at it and get confused because it's got three terminals on it. But in reality, it's still a four wire valve. So I want you to think of it this way. Terminal one and two are your two yellow wires. That is my motor side. Terminal two and three are your two red wires or your end switch. So terminal two is a common terminal. And again, how the valve works is if my thermostat closes, power from my transformer, power switch, load is the zone valve motor. I heat that up, it pushes down the plunger and as the plunger makes contact at the bottom and opens the valve, it also now makes an end switch. So now I break contact at one and two, but since it's a heat motor and that wax is heated up and expanded, it's slowly gonna cool off. And if, if it's a long call for heat, well then as it gets to a certain point, we'll then re-energize again and push open. So the valve slowly modulates up and down as we're going through the heat call process. So as you see here on the screen, it's gonna wire the exact same way as a standard four wire zone valve. All right, any questions on that? I know that could be a little confusing if you've never seen it before, but if you had to change one of these out and all of you, and you had just a standard four wire, that's how you wire it in. Any questions there, Rob? No, 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 not the moment. Okay, very good. Next screen, please. So now that we've identified our zone valves here, we do have to figure out amp draw. And like anything in our, in our world, we have some formulas. So amp draw is really the amount of volt amps you have to provide. And if my transformer is not large enough to handle the load, we smoke the transformer, all right? And the joke is you've let the smoke out. So there's a way to figure this out. So there's a couple of really cool things you could do. We can read the instructions because the instructions will always tell you what the volt amps are for that particular valve. Or you can do what I do when I need information quickly. I use a very important tool. Robbie, we call it Google. We can Google anything. So here, Honeywell 4-Wire. You could just Google it and it's 0.32 amp draw. The Takeo 570 is a 0.9 amp draw. It's pretty large. And the Takeo Zone Century valve, which is a four wire valve, ball valve body, is only a 0 0.06 amp draw. So a very simple formula here. If you know what the amp draw is of that valve, multiply it by how many valves you're gonna have, and then multiply that by 24 volts, and that will tell you the volt amps you need to provide for, the, for that number of valves. So if we do some math here, Next screen, please, Rob. We do some math here. Let's, let's concentrate on four zones for the Honeywell. So at 0.32 times four, that's gonna give us the 1.28. So that's where that number's coming from. We're gonna multiply it by 24 volts. So four three-quarter Honeywells, standard valves that you have on your truck, will pull 30.72 volt amps. 
So a 40 VA transformer works for that, okay? If you do a TACO 570, we're showing you that it's a 0.9, and on our box, we'll show you three. So 0.9 times three gives you 2.7, so that's where that number's coming from. Multiply that by 24 volts, you get the 64.8 volt amps. And we're telling you on our box, three of those will work on a 40 VA transformer. The math doesn't tell you it will work, but it will work because of that, because they're slow opening, slow close. So first off, we don't count on all three of them coming on at once, but if they did, since it's a slow draw, we'll be okay. You can't go anywhere over three at all. So that would be your maximum. We take the Takeo Zone Century at a 0 0.06, and I'm picking 12. So I'm gonna use 12 of these. So 0 0.06 times 12, that's where 0 0.72 comes from. Multiply that by 24 volts, and that means I can run 12 Takeo Zone Century Zone valves on a 40 VA transformer because it's only pulling 17.28 volt amps. So you could do more than 12 on a 40 VA. So this is really pretty cool. So let's get some a little, a little bit more uh, history as to what's going on here. The Honeywell's power open. We've got a synchronous motor, power's open, and it's pulling power because we're fighting against the spring. The spring is what we're fighting against because once we have satisfied the call for heat, you hear, because ah, the spring now pulls it back. It cuts power, the spring pulls it back. So that's a constant amp draw. The Takeo 571s, it's a big amp draw to heat up the wax, but once I've opened the valve, we cut power there, and it's a slow, slow close as the wax cools. The Takeo Zone Sentry is a ball valve, and I'm gonna power that ball valve to open, and once it powers open with a quarter turn, we cut power. There's no spring, there's a circuit board on there, and there is a capacitor and the capacitor is storing power. So that's giving a trickle of power to the circuit board. So it's not a constant draw against the uh, transformer. And now then when the call for heat is satisfied, then I power it closed. So it powers open, cuts power, and then we power close. So that's why it's such a low amp draw, okay? So we always have to figure out why or how much VA I need, and if I have more VA than a 40 can provide, I have to get a bigger transformer. Okay, Rob, next. All right, so the other thing you're gonna play with a lot in our industry are relays, and here is a single switching relay, a circulator relay, this is the Takeo SR501. This SR501 is our equivalent to a Honeywell 832, an uh, 845, and an 89A. So if you had this on your truck, you can replace three different relays that you may trip across out there in the field. So as we go to our next slide here, the, the sequence of operation is really pretty cool. So here's, you're looking inside the SR501. And on the left-hand side, you see the transformer and you'll see the darkly drawn lines coming into N and H, and that's the 120 volts coming into the primary side of the transformer. On the left hand, right hand side of the transformer is the low voltage side, and you can see the lightly drawn lines. And they go up to TT or RW, and you'll see that the thermostat is connected there. So one side of the transformer is my low voltage power, the thermostat is my switch. Now if we follow the wire, the line coming down from T, it goes into what looks like a band, and what that is is your, your hunk of iron, with copper windings on it, and that is my relay coil. That is my load. So on the low voltage side, you can see my power for my transformer, switch is thermostat, load is the relay coil. Now, on the bottom of the SR501, you will see at terminal three, a jumper. And I'm bringing power, incoming power from there into terminal three. And if you follow the dark line up from terminal three, you see there's two switches there, a normally open switch and a normally closed switch. And on the bottom, you'll also see terminal four normally open, terminal four normally closed. So I give you two options here as to where you wanna put a line voltage load 
or an item that's going to use that power. So here we're showing you we've got our circulator on normally open. And the reason why I have it there is because I want intermittent operation. I only want that pump to come on when there's a call for heat. As we continue over to the right, you'll see two number six terminals. One's a normally close, one's a normally open. All right, so we don't want to always have our boiler firing, so we are coming out of normally open in terminal five and connecting to our boiler TT, the Aquastat relay. So Rob, if we hit the next slide, our thermostat and hit it again now has fallen. So we have closed the thermostat. We have energized our relay coil. Can you go back one more, please? Just sure. click back. So now I want you to watch the normally closed switches. Since we've energized the relay coil, and we've made a magnet. Now they're going to open and our normally open switches are going to hit the button, Rob, close. Hit it again. Now we've energized our circulator. Click it again, please. We've energized the circulator and we have now made the end switch at the boiler and we're closed and the boiler's making a fire, all right? That is what's happening here. If the circulator was on normally closed, that circulator would have been running because there's constant power there. But now when the thermostat called, we would have opened that switch, we would have turned the circulator off. So there may be jobs where you want constant circulation, and that's where you would have used that normally closed. But since I want intermittent operation, we're going to use normally open. What do you think, Rob? Did that make sense? It makes sense to me. Makes sense to you? We're still excited? People are still uh, <laughs> clued in? Yeah, yeah. We got a question, actually. Mm. Um, why do manufacturers recommend to isolate the end switch from three wires zone valves to TT? You mean the Taco 571? Uh, three terminal? Because that's, a, that's a, got an isolated end switch built into it, so there's really nothing you have to do. Right. It's built into it. So I think that is answering this question. I'm not 100% sure. All right. Robbie, let's uh, move forward. Uh, Unless you got another question? Yeah, well, uh, gentleman wants to know what is terminal five? Terminal five is just the other half of that switch. That's all it is. It's just the other half of that switch. And when we close normally open six, we complete the circuit between the num uh, normally open six and five going to the Aquastat relay on the boiler, the TT or the RT, depending on what uh, manufacturer you have. Oh, one other thing to talk about is this single switching relay has two lights on it. So this helps in the troubleshooting world because there is a power light which should always be lit up as green. So I always try to give the, you know, the scenario, it's the midnight call, Rob staggers down to that gentleman's basement and they have a no heat situation. He sees the green light so he knows he's got power to his equipment. He doesn't have to run to this uh, circuit board uh, or his uh, and check to see if there's a, a, a breaker that open. He sees the green light, he's got power. If there was a call for heat, the bottom light would light up as red. So if he doesn't see a call for heat, we're now starting to isolate back that maybe there's a problem at the thermostat. Did the batteries go bad, right? Or is it a power stealing stat and I've lost my 24 volts? Did I lose, did I lose that? Did somebody do a renovation in the house uh, during the day and maybe pinch the wire or hit it with a staple or, you know, did something. So those lights, you know, if they're not there, as I always say, for entertainment, they're going to help you. Next screen, please. Yeah, it's going to, it's going to do it twice. Oh, there, we go. there we go. All right. So now what we're looking at here are relay coils and switches in a wiring diagram. So if I'm looking at a wiring diagram, again, dark colored lines signify line voltage. Lightly colored lines or dotted lines will signify low voltage. So the, low, the line voltage that you see on the top and the line voltage that you see on the bottom is the same voltage. They draw it this way so you can see what's on the line voltage side, what's on the low voltage side. So how am I going to power that load? I'm going to concentrate on the low voltage side. So I see my power, which is my transformer. 
I see my switch, which is a thermostat. And in this drawing, it's closed, all right? And then I see my load, 1K relay coil. Every relay coil in a wiring diagram will have a switch addressed to it. And that switch may be on the low voltage side, may be on the line voltage side. So in order for me to power this load, I have to energize the 1K relay coil. So my thermostat closes. I now completed my circuit of power switch and load. That relay coil is energized, becomes a magnet, and the 1K1 switch on the line voltage side is going to close. Now I've completed that circuit, and now I've energized that load. Okay? Pretty cool, pretty simple, because the three things are always there, power switch and load, power switch and load. So I'm showing you that we're using a low voltage circuit to turn on a line voltage load. So another way to look at it is this diagram here. So I need you to answer some questions for me. If you can type in, what is the load on the low voltage side? Identify the load on the low voltage side. Please type in what that is. I see that Gary had asked that question. Maybe Gary can give it to me. All right. Uh, well, we have uh, we got a bunch of answers here. So Gary says the 1K coil. Actually, that's what they were all saying, the 1K coil and relay coil. Right. Well, what's really important is identifying what it is. So, yeah, it's a relay coil, but, okay, it's 1K. So very, very good. The 1K relay coil is our low voltage load. So what's my sequence of operation? Thermostat's going to close. I complete the circuit of power switch and load. I energize 1K relay coil. Then my 1K1 and my 1K2 switches are going to close. And now I energize heat strip 1, heat strip 2, and my fan motor. All right, next question. Is this wired in series or in parallel? What do you think? Russ got it. I can see that. Yeah. All right, so we're getting 50-50. A couple of people think it's parallel. Some people think it's series, and it is in parallel. So how do we know it's in parallel? Well, both loads, or actually all three loads on the line voltage side are sharing the same power but they each have their own individual switch. So let's look at it this way. We energize the 1K relay coil and 1K1 closes, 1K2 closes. Both heat strips are energized in the fan motor. If I lose heat strip one, it will not affect the fan motor and it will not affect heat strip two. If I lose heat strip two, it doesn't affect heat strip one or the fan motor. So let me ask you this. If I lose the fan motor, does it affect heat strip one and heat strip two? What do you think? So a bunch of people are saying no, and you're correct, but it, this is kind of a sneaky question. Since they're heat strips, they're going to be energized, but they'll eventually burn out because I need to blow air across them. I need to dissipate that heat. So if you run into a project where you've got heat strips and they have failed and you've got power to them, well, it could be that your fan motor failed, and that's what caused them to, uh, to fail. But that's great. You guys are getting it. Perfect. All right. So another way of drawing this up is a ladder diagram. And I really like ladder diagrams because, to me, they're very clear, and I can put all kinds of stuff on every single run and identify every single circuit on either my low-voltage side or my line-voltage side. So, again... Darkly drawn lines are my line voltage. Lightly drawn lines are my low voltage. So in the middle there, that signifies my transformer. So there's my low voltage power. I always start there. I find my switch. It's labeled as thermostat. I find my load, 1K relay. So if I got my load as a 1K relay, there's got to be switches addressed to it. I see on the line voltage side, 1K1, 1K1 and 1K2, I see the loads that are part of each circuit, 
and I see where the power is coming from, there's my power switch and load. So if I energize 1K relay, the other switches all close, and I energize those heat strips and the fan motor. All right, Robbie, next one. So here is something that you guys have seen a million times out there in the field. This is your Honeywell L8140 AD. Very common out there. There's thousands of them out there. And the top is showing you where things are wired. It's not giving you a sequence of operation. It's showing you where things are wired. So you can see at the top where you've got T and TV, and that's where the thermostat would go. Then you also see a W and a Z. Those are two terminals. Think of them as wire nuts. And in between there, you'll normally see a brass. It's not a wire. It's a piece of brass. kind of looks like a, a, a wrench almost. And that's the jumper between W and Z. And we're showing you here that you have the potential of wiring in a low limit if you choose. Then as you go further down, you'll see the high, lo high limit, which is B and R. On the bottom, you'll see where the gas valve is coming in at B1, B2. You'll see where a circulator would be wired or any 120 volt load at C1, C2. And then you see L1, L2, that's where we're bringing in line voltage to this Aquastat relay. So now I look at the bottom and that's gonna give me my sequence of operation. So on the bottom, dark line is my line voltage, so it's labeled L1, L2, and you can see my transformer. So my transformer is going to give me my low voltage on the low voltage side. So where would you place a jumper? Type this in. Where would you place a jumper in order to energize the load on the low voltage circuit? Where would you place that jumper? And I wish I had my, my remote so I can highlight it. So look at your low voltage side, identify where your load is, identify where your power is, and what would be that switch? So if you're gonna place a jumper here, where would you put it? Any bites there, Robbie? B1, B2. Okay, anybody else? Uh, TV? T and TV. Excellent. That is correct. Yes, because that's where our thermostat would normally go. So if I don't put a thermostat there and I just put a jumper, just a piece of T-stat wire between T and TV, I've now completed my low voltage circuit. My power is from my transformer. My switch is between T and TV. My load is the 1K relay. And then you see that Z and W, that's just two terminals or two wire nuts with a jumper between it, that completes that 24 volt low voltage circuit. Now, if I energize 1K, what two switches are going to now close? Please type that in. I've energized 1K, what two switches are going to now close? So Jack's got one of them. Well, Jack's telling me where the power is going to go, but so they're not going to close. I need to know which switches they are. All right, Gary's got it. So 1K1 will close, and that's on the line voltage side, and 1K2 is going to close, and that's on the low voltage side. So if I put a jumper between T and TV, next thing I'm going to hear is the circulator is going to come on because I've closed that circuit and wired to C1, C2 is my circulator. So my circulator is going to be running. And then 1K2 is going to close, and then it's going to go through that high limit, which is a normally closed switch. It's a safety. It has to stay closed. And now that will energize my gas valve, because the gas valve is wired to B1 and B2. Excellent. Very good. Very good. All right. Next screen, please, Rob. All right, so here's a more sophisticated system. And here's a ladder diagram. And I, I, I uh, apologize that it's a little facocta there, but we'll make it better next time. And what you're going to see here is we're going to show you what 
domestic hot water priority looks like on a wiring diagram. So here's my ladder diagram. Let's look at our low voltage side. We've got four zones. Two, three of them are space heating because you see room thermostat, room thermostat, room thermostat. And then one of them is our domestic load. It's going to be our indirect, and there is a aquastat there. So let's go down to zone two. Zone two is a space heating load. So let's identify the circuit. So my power is coming from my transformer. I come down to my room thermostat. That has to close. That's my switch. What is my load? The load is R2. That's a relay coil. So my load is R2. I energize that load, and now I've completed that circuit. So if R2 is my relay coil, I have some switches that are addressed to R2. So what else is addressed to R2? Well, on the line voltage side, there is an R2 normally open switch. And if I energize my R2 relay coil, that switch will close and that circulator will come on. Also underneath it is another R2 switch that will close and that will send 24 volts down to the B coil. We'll energize that and complete that circuit. And in energizing the B coil, we close the B switch, which now is going to fire our boiler. Pretty simple. So that's the same thing on zone three. That's the same thing on zone four. Now, the domestic call, the indirect, the aquastat, that is my switch. So my power is from my 24 volt thermostat, uh, uh, 24 volt transformer. My aquastat closes because the temperature in the tank fell. I energize the one, the R1 relay coil, and I complete that circuit. So R1 is going to close on the line voltage side and turn on the circulator. R1 underneath the R1 relay coil will close and send power down to the B coil, which again will close the B switch and fire the boiler. There's another switch here that has to do something. Can you guys identify what switch that is? Robbie knows he's all excited. R1. Excellent. Excellent. So the normally closed R1 switch has to open. Excellent. And what did that do? Now that cut power to any of the space heating zones. So even if the thermostat for zone two, three, or four all close because they're all calling for heat, they're not going to get any power until we have satisfied our domestic load. That's domestic hot water priority. That's what's going out there, going on out there in the field. So whether your boiler has this already built into its controls, whether this is something you're doing with the Taco switching relay, or you've got an older job where you've got multiple relays out there, this is what's going on. Okay? Excellent, excellent. All right, next screen, please. So this is a Tecmar box. And I actually got a call two weeks ago from a large uh, contractor who asked if I could come in and do a class on this, on this item because he's got some new techs in the company and uh, they're not comfortable with this or they get intimidated by it. And I said to him, well, all it is is a relay box. He goes, yeah, I know that. He goes, but my techs need to know that. So I want you to look really close to, at this Look at where you see uh, terminal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And it's, this box is telling you what's going to happen. So if I look at terminal 1 and 2, it says boiler demand. Well, that would be a, a TT. And what is the symbol you see on top of 1 and 2? That is a relay coil. So if I put a jumper across terminal 1 and 2, I've just closed a switch and now I've energized a relay coil, all right? I'm creating a demand. So now let's look across where I see terminal five and terminal seven. And there's a normally open switch there and it says boil P1. So that's the boiler circulator. So if I have a circulator wired there, that normally open switch will close. I'm gonna turn on that circulator. Okay, that's what's happening there. If I go further over to where it says terminal 11 and 12, it says boiler. There's a normally open switch. 
that will close and that's what's going to now turn on the boiler so pretty simple it's really no different than what we just went over it's just a really sophisticated looking box that I can do some programming in let's look at the domestic side the domestic DHW demand terminal 3 and 4 and what's above it a relay coil so if I put a jumper across 3 and 4 I now close the contact to domestic hot water demand and I have now energized that coil go over to 9 and 10 terminal and there's a normally open switch and that's domestic pr priority that's that pump that switch will close I will turn on that pump and we also fire the boiler so depending how this was piped and the sequence of operation you may be still firing a boiler pump and you also will be firing the domestic pump All right there's a very important phrase we use in our industry it's called it depends it depends on his how this was set up for sequence of operation so on the right hand side where it says do not apply power that's where different thermistors are going to be wired and this is what's going to measure temperatures these are where we're going to measure the outdoor temperature this is where we're going to measure the temperature within the indirect and this is where we're going to measure the supply water temperature so those temperatures are just telling the box where it has to be in sequence of operation too and then you've got item and up and down arrows really if you read the instructions you press all three that gets you into the adjust screen that's where you can make your adjustments this is where you can set the temperatures that you want this is where you can set your outdoor uh, design temperature this is where you set your warm weather shutdown and this is where you set the temperature you want to see inside so really all it is is a relay box that you can add some programming to how do you feel about that Rob you feel good yeah all right Robbie's good I'm good all right next um, slide oh I'm sorry we're gonna go back one slide back up um, so the gentleman asked the question domestic hot water is a series style circuit uh, with priority switching in parentheses it, how is it series what series that's uh, that's why I wanted to bring it up because I'm not exactly sure uh, I, I only see parallel wire this is parallel all the way across the board because if the if the circulator failed on the domestic hot water side it wouldn't affect any other circulators if the aquastat stuck open or stuck closed either way it would affect how the whole sequence of operation works if it's stuck closed then we would never get any space heating but if it's stuck open we'd never get any hot water either all right so they really they're not in series it's a ladder and it's in parallel I, I hope that's clear all right okay next slide please all right so here is a wiring diagram and ladder diagram from a Juan McLean CGA boiler all right in our territory here when uh, Johnny Russo who works with us was working for Juan McLean they dominated this market and <laughs> these CGAs are everywhere here and this is a standing pilot with a vent damper so on the left hand side is the wiring schematic we're showing you where the different items get wired to but on the right hand side is the ladder diagram which gives you your sequence of operation so looking at the ladder diagram I'm identifying my power so the dark line is your uh, incoming power your line voltage and the lightly drawn line is the 24 volts so on the 24 volt side I identify my transformer there's my power now let's figure out what we have in our circuits uh, first things first on the line voltage side service switch has to be closed so it's drawn there in the open position but if I've got no power anywhere let's see if somebody flipped the service switch by accident all right and if they did we're gonna close it and maybe that fixes our problem if they didn't then I got to see wh what happened power at the uh, circuit panel all right so let's say I got my power so now I'm on the low voltage side I see my power is coming from my transformer what's my main switch there it's my thermostat and what's my load the CR relay coil so if I go power switch and load energize that CR relay coil I've completed that circuit type in the switches that are are addressed to the CR relay coil please 
All right, type in what switches are addressed to the CR relay coil. Look hard, this is important. What switches are addressed to that CR relay coil? Now remember, the thermostat is the switch that's going to start things off, but it's not addressed to the relay coil. So what is addressed to that relay coil? Meaning when I energize that relay coil, what other switches are going to now change their position? All right, we do see an answer. So CR1 and CR2 are the switches that are addressed to that relay coil. So thermostat closes, power switch and load, energize CR relay coil. CR1 on the low voltage side will close. CR2 on the line voltage side will close. So first thing you're going to hear is the circulator will come on. And now if I follow the low voltage side, I go through CR1. Then I have to go through a bunch of different switches. I got to go through maybe an additional limit switch. If it's there, it may not be there. I got a spill switch. That's a normally closed switch that's in your venting. That has to stay closed. I got a limit switch, that's another safety switch, that's got to stay closed. I got a flame rollout switch, which could be set up, resettable or non-resettable, that's got to stay closed. And then I go into my vent damper motor. So circulator's going to come on, then I should hear, vent damper motor is energized and opens, that will close its own switch. And if you follow the power down, now it goes to the gas valve, which will energize those two coils in the gas valve, which opens the gas valve, and since it's standing pilot, boof, we make a fire. Boof, as Robbie says, boof. So pretty simple sequence of operation here. If that spill switch was open, we're not going to open the vent damper, we're not going to open the gas valve, we're not going to make a fire. But the circulator is still going to be running. If the rollout switch was tripped, same thing. Circulator is going to be running, but we're not going to open the vent damper. We're not going to make that switch, and we're not going to energize the gas valve. So if, if that was happening, I have to look at the switches that are in series, all right, because it's switch, 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 and make sure they're in closed position. And if they're not, why did that happen? And I got to figure that problem out, all right? All right. Next slide, please. So the next slide is now a spark ignition CGA boiler. So again, left-hand side is showing you where all the parts and pieces are wired to, but the right-hand side is giving you your sequence of operation. And you'll notice here that the actual spark igniter is, is drawn on the low voltage side and the line voltage side. So inside that spark igniter box, we're, t we're closing switches and energizing low voltage and line voltage items. So again, the dark line signifies our line voltage. You see the service switch is drawn in an open position. Always make sure that's closed. Okay, low voltage side. There is my, low, my power from my transformer. And if I follow the wire down, I'm going to see my thermostat. So there's my main switch. So there's my power. There's my switch. I go into the spark box, and you can see... Out of that is wired the vent damper, but also the circulator on the line voltage side. So when that thermostat closes, we're going to hear the vent damper opening and the circulator is going to come on. Further down on the low voltage side, I have to go through the rollout. I've got to go through a limit switch. I got to go through the spill switch, just like I did in the other diagram. They have to stay closed. Once that vent damper opens, you're going to see the vent damper end switch is going to now close, which will then energize my spark igniter and the gas valve. Woof, we make a fire, okay? So again, I could energize this system up and have the circulator running, but still not fire it because the vent damper may not have opened and it didn't make its switch to then energize the spark igniter to start sparking and open the gas valve. Sometimes, and back in the day, 
when uh, vent dampers were kind of new on the sc on the scene, guys would use a little extra long screw when they connected to the venting. Sometimes that would hang up the vent damper, not make the end switch. Sometimes the vent damper motor failed, so the contractor, you guys are smart guys, you jump it out, so I have a constant closed end switch on the vent damper. Not a good idea, but that's how you got people through, okay? All right, next slide, please, Robbie. So here, we're going to start talking about how I lay out the system, what my sequence of operation is going to be. And it's based on your design, your piping layout, and how many circulators and things I need to operate. So if I look at this uh, piping diagram, I'm showing you three zones of space heating and one zone of domestic hot water. So the sequence of operation here is if any of those space heating zones call, the circulator will come on and we should fire the boiler. If domestic hot water calls, the circulator will come on, that valve will open and I'll fire the boiler. So in this job here, that zone valve, which is the Takeo uh, Zone Century, uh, that has the highest flow rate, by the way, out of any zone valve out there on the market, the standard three quarter, if it's the sweater threaded version, can handle 10.3 uh, GPM. So if I need to move 10.G3 PM or less, I could do this with a zone valve and just run one circulator. But if I have to run a greater amount of GPM, I gotta move more than 10 GPM in order to make my domestic load, I'll have to change that to a circulator. And now I gotta figure out how I'm gonna operate. Do I run two circulators, one circulator? What am I gonna do? So next uh, screen here, please. So if I was gonna wire up what we just saw there to a Takeo ZVC controller. All right, this is how we're gonna do it. So let me identify a few things on this ZVC controller. We label where the thermostats are and we give you an R, W, and C. So if it's just a two wire stat, that's gonna go to R and W. The C is a terminal for constant 24 volts. So if it's a digital thermostat, you're gonna use the C terminal to give you 24 volts. So two wire, three wire, doesn't matter, we're good to go. On the bottom, we give you four terminals. One and two is motor, three and four is end switch. So since this is a four wire motorized valve from Takeo, one and two is my motor, three and four is end switch. And on the valve itself, which does not come with wires, but we give you two wiring harnesses, we label 24 volts and end switch. So, so far everybody can wire this up. On the right-hand side, you'll see a whole sequence of lights. And number one is the power light to show you where, if we've got power, that's gonna be a green light that's gonna be lit. And then there's two sets of lights per valve to show you when there's a call for heat and to show you that the zone valve opened and made its end switch. We have the isolated end switch on the upper left-hand corner. That's gonna go to TT on the boiler or RT. And on the lower left, that's where we're gonna be able to drive circulators. So Rob, if you wouldn't mind clicking the, the button for the next sequence, please. And you can click a bunch of times. So there's my uh, zone valves on the top. For my domestic, since it's uh, gonna be my priority zone, that always goes on the last zone. And in the upper right-hand corner, you see a priority switch. So if you want to prioritize that zone, you just put that switch to on. So think about the wiring sequence we showed you earlier. That means I've got a normally closed switch there. And when priority calls, that switch is going to open and not allow power to go to the space heating zones. That's your domestic priority. Uh, next, please. So here we're highlighting the end switch. That's going to take two wires out. And that's what's going to go to TT on the boiler. And on the lower left-hand side is where I have dry contacts and where I can wire multiple circulators. We have to bring power into this box. This box has transformer or transformers on it, depending on how large the box is. And that allows us to give enough VA to our zone valves. So if I was to set up my job this way, now I've got two circulators. I need more GPM to go to that indirect and I can't pass it through a zone valve, I need a circulator. So type in, let Rob know, how many circulators do I need to run to deliver space heating? 
So if the zones call for space heating, how many circulators do I need to run? Or how many circulators do I need to energize? Um, general consensus is one. Excellent. Well, we got, we got one, two. All right. So we're only going to do one. So it's the one on the top. It's one on the supply side, all right, right after your air separator. I have to keep that one running if any of those three zones of space heating call. And that means the circulator that's going down to the bottom, going to my indirect, is going to be in the off position. So how many circulators do I need to run? Oh, God, an update? Are you kidding? How many circulators do I need to run for domestic hot water? We need to run one. We just need to run the one for the indirect. So I have to sequence these two circulators. So, Robbie, if you wouldn't mind advancing, please. Absolutely. Uh, I do have a question here. Yes, sir. Um, so we discussed in the uh, in the ZBC here. Uh, the gentleman wants to know: uh, Does the Takeo SR box uh, have the same uh, sequence? We will go over that in a couple of slides. All right, perfect. All right. So how are we going to sequence this? Next slide, please. So on the bottom left is where I have these dry contacts. And what does a dry contact mean? If they're switches that are either normally open or closed that will change their position as the, as the box is energized, but there's no power there. We have to bring power to them. So Robbie, on, on one of the computers, there's an upgrade or an update on Citrix. Oh. If you can get rid of that, please. Yeah. All right, so sorry about that, guys. So uh, again, on the lower left, there is a, uh, the three switches for circulators and their dry contacts. So my pump end switch is the switch on this panel that's always open and will close any time there's a call on, the, on this board. So whether there's a space heating call or whether there's a domestic hot water call, this switch goes from open to close. So I'm bringing power into that switch, that's the H. I'm bringing power out of that switch and now it's going to the common terminal. I want you to think of a common terminal as an exit ramp off of a highway. What am I talking about? So if I get off on a, on a highway here in New Jersey and I get off on that exit ramp, I can either go to the right or I can go to the left. One, the left will take me over the highway, the right will take me out to wherever I'm going, okay? So that means my common terminal power can go either to the switch to the right of it or the switch to the left of it. So here we're bringing power into common and I'm coming out of what's called the normally closed switch. That switch is going to always stay closed unless domestic hot water calls. And that's where I put the system circulator. That's my space heating circulator. So I come out of there, I pick up one side of the circulator, and then I take my neutral wire back to complete that circuit. The domestic hot water circulator, Rob, if you wouldn't mind hitting the button, the domestic hot water circulator I'm going to put at normally open because I only want that to run when there's a call for domestic hot water. If you see a dot, that's a wire nut. So I'm taking power out of normally open to one side of domestic circulator, wiring it to the combined neutral going back to my incoming power. So Rob, if you wouldn't mind hitting the next button, please. And then out of my end switch, on the top left goes to the TT on the boiler. So the next switch, please. So when there's a call on this panel, any thermostat closes or the, the uh, aquastat closes, the pump end switch will close. So since that is closed, that will allow power to go through that switch to common and the normally closed switch stays closed. So now I've completed that switch and now I energize the system circulator. So now the, zone, the three zone valves for space heating are open, or one or two of them are open. That circulator is running, but the domestic is not. I got a domestic call. Next uh, button, please, Rob. Now the normally closed switch will open, and the normally open switch will close, and that will now give power to the domestic circulator. The space heating circulator is off. 
So that's how I can sequence two circulators for this particular project. All right, next slide, please, Rob. And we tell you, whoop, back up. Sorry. We tell you, and this is right on the instructions that are inside the cover of this uh, relay box, that we want you to put a jumper, if you're going to use a circulator for your domestic hot water across terminal three and four, to make sure that we're telling the box that the end switch is closed. Okay? All right. Next, please. What if you pipe up the job this way? You pipe it up as primary, secondary. I need you guys to type in and let Rob know how many circulators or circulator or whatever have to be energized or running in order to send heat to the three zone valves. Two, two, one, two, two. So for everybody who said for everybody who said two, you're correct. That means the loop coming off the boiler, and since it has our expansion tank, that is our primary loop, that circulator has to run to induce flow throughout that loop. If you come to our hydronic cl classes that we do, you see that this is primary secondary. I've got two closely spaced T's that separate the space heating and separate the domestic loads. So no hot water or no BTUs <clears throat> from the boiler side will be going into the space heating load unless that other circulator, the space heating circulator, is energized. Because of the closely spaced T's, or I should do it this way, the water from the primary will just go right past those two holes. But when the circulator is on for space heating, that will now pull BTUs into the space heating side. How many circulators need to run if there's a domestic hot water coil? Coal. Two, 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 one, two. It's two. Same thing. The primary loop circulator has to run, and the circulator that's feeding the indirect has to run. So I have to turn off the space heating circulator. So how are we going to do that? Rob, if you wouldn't mind, please. So we're going back to the same picture that we showed you before, and now I got to bring in that primary circulator. The space heating circulator or secondary still stays on normally closed. The domestic still stays on normally open. But since my primary circulator on the primary loop has to always run, Rob, if you hit the button, it will wire that to the normal to the pump end switch because remember that switch is always going to close when anything on this panel calls. Okay, so now if, if the uh, space heating calls, I run two circulators. If domestic calls, I turn off the secondary and I run the primary and the domestic circulator. All right, any questions on that? Uh, are most unit primary pumps internal? Nowadays, a lot of the uh, condensing boilers that you're buying they, buying, they have controls where they will drive their own, or control, I should say, their own boiler pump. And they also give you the option of probably draw, uh, driving or controlling the domestic pump. So again, it depends. You may, you may have that control there or it may be a bigger system and you need these other uh, external controls to drive other circulators too. All right, next uh, screen here, please. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what this question exactly means. How much stronger a primary pump for heat? Uh, the, I think that really is gonna depend. Oh, okay, I, I got an idea what he's asking. If you're asking how do we size these circulators, that depends on the GPM that we have to deliver. All right, or how many BTUs. And again, with the way it's piped with the primary secondary, each circulator is sized for the GPM or BTUs that each part of the system has to deliver. So the boiler circulator has to deliver the same amount, the, the total GPM or BTUs for the whole system. And the pipe has to be sized that way. Then the piping going out to the space heating is size for the BTUs for the space heating load, and then the, the uh, piping and the circulator for the domestic size are size for that pipe size and BTU for the domestic load. 
We do a whole thing hydro on the hydronic pipe sizing and pumping sizing. And uh, if you ever get a chance to take any of those classes with us live and in person, or go on our website to watch uh, the advanced hydronics class or today's hydronics class, that's where we go over that stuff. All right, next screen, please, Robbie. Uh, one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, if a ModCon boiler internal fails, I'm assuming he's talking about the internal pump, mm. will the system still run? Probably not. Probably not. If there's no flow through that boiler, that boiler should not fire. Right. All right. It would go off on its limit switch because I'm making heat, but I can't move any GPM through there. So it'll go off. It may go off on a pressure switch, a limit switch. But yeah, you're going to have an issue. All right. What if you piped it this way? And this is quite common. And it's still primary secondary, but we're taking the domestic right off of the primary loop not with closely spaced T's, so we call this direct hot water. So type into Rob, how many circulators have to run for domestic hot water? All right. One, 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 one. One, one, and one. That means the domestic circulator runs, not the primary circulator on the primary loop, and not the secondary circulator. If I need to deliver space heating, I have to now turn on two circulators, the primary loop and the secondary loop or the, the space heating loop. So how are we going to sequence this? Next slide, please. So again, we're back down to the dry contacts. And now my, my space heating circulator stays in the same spot normally closed. My domestic circulator stays in the same spot normally open. Now I only need to have the primary circulator run for space heating. So if you have an idea where it's going to be wired to, type it in. I'll give you a second. Think about where you want to drive that primary circulator. This only has to come on when space heating calls, but it needs to be off when the domestic calls. So am I going to still keep it on pump and switch? Will it go to normally close? Will it go to normally open? Take a shot, see where we're at. Where would you wire the primary circulator? All right, so I got 50-50. A couple of people are saying normally close. A couple of people are saying normally open. Rob, if you hit the button, please. We're gonna take it out of normally closed. Because that switch in this, on this a relay box stays closed unless domestic calls. So if there was a space heating call, the pump end switch is always going to close. Power will go through the common, come out of normally close and energize the secondary and the primary circulator. If domestic calls, now the normally closed switch will open and the normally open switch will close. So I cut power going to the primary circulator and the secondary circulator, and only the domestic circulator calls. All right? Pretty cool, huh? Oh, and one thing I failed to tell you is I did talk about those lights. So we do have a, a, a power light to show you that there's power to the board. Then each zone, each space heating zone, has two lights. So if the thermostat calls, I will get a yellow light. So zone one's calling, I got a yellow light. Once the zone valve opens and it makes its end switch, I will get a red light. That's a really good troubleshooting tool because if I show up and there's a problem with one of the zones and I'm showing that I have power and I'm showing I'm getting a call for heat, but I'm not getting the red light, that's telling me I have a zone valve problem. And I had this call last week contractor called me up. He said, I need you. I need help in troubleshooting your box. Your red light's not coming on. And I asked him if, if, if this was the sequence. You got a call for heat? Yes. You got power? Yes. We're seeing the uh, yellow light, but you're not seeing the red light. Yeah. I said, you have a zone valve problem. He goes, no, your red light's not coming on. I said, that's correct because your zone valve is not opening. And he didn't believe me. Then I heard him say, holy cow, I can't even manually open it. He goes, you're right. I said, yeah, that's what the lights are telling us. So very, very good tool. These relay boxes take a tech that may be new to the industry, fresh out of school, 
or like, you know, he's been bouncing around for a couple of years working for some people. Now he's working for you. And this will allow him to wire up most of your boiler systems and a pretty bulletproof method. I mean, my son wired our system at home and never did anything with low voltage. He spent four years working for an electrician while going through college. So he knows the line voltage side. When it came to wiring up our system, I just showed him, you know, where you're bringing line voltage in, where everything else goes. 20 minutes later, he was done, and we've been working like that ever since. So these boxes can elevate your tech's uh, technical level, all right, and make him even more productive. Next slide, please. So the question came, do we have the same sequence, and what do we do when it comes to SR panels or our pump relay panels? And yes, we're going to follow the same sequence. We just don't give you as many lights. So as you can see here, we do give you an R, W, and C on the top for your zone valves. On the bottom is where every single pump will go. You have an extra air, uh, area for another pump, depending if you need a system pump besides your zone pumps. Uh, you got your green light on there for power. When there's a call, you'll have a red light per zone. And... Um, there's always a priority switch on these panels for the last zone if it's going to be domestic. Okay, Rob, if you wouldn't mind. So you can see where we bring the thermostats in. So I apologize, this is an older slide, but we do have an RWC on the top. So we can handle three wire uh, power stealing stats. And on the bottom, you can see where we're going to have multiple zone pumps. Incoming power, it's really very, very simple. Next slide, please, Rob. And if I'm going to add an indirect, my Aquastat would get wired to zone four. That's my priority. And my priority zone is number four. I had that circulator size for that load. And I have my priority switch to, if you click the button, Rob, we should go to on. Yeah, trust me, it's on. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. So here, just showing you a zone pump uh, situation or job. So, Rob, you're just going to have to click the button multiple times. So you're going to see incoming power going through all these different switches that you will have before we even get to our boiler and our panel. So the circuit breaker, a customer emergency switch, a service switch, low water cutoff. And here the low water cutoff, oh, Robbie, the low water cutoff here is 120 volt. So if this low water cutoff opened... I'm going to cut off power to everything here. If it was a 24 volt low water cutoff, we would just cut off power to the gas valve. But this one's 120 volt. We're just going to cut off power to the whole thing. So on the top, you can see where our thermostats would be wired and or aquastat. <clears throat> you can see where the end switch will come out and go to the TT on the boiler. On the bottom, we're bringing in incoming power, and that's where our 120 is going to each individual zone circulator. And we're also bringing power to the Aquastat relay right on the boiler. So depending on how you set these systems up when you're zoning with circulators, maybe you want the Aquastat relay to run the circulator that's part of the boiler. Maybe you want to run it on the SR panel. It is up to you. Next slide, please, Rob. So here we're showing you a ZVC 406. Here we're showing you how we're going to wire this. So Rob, if you just go through clicking the button, please. <clears throat> Again, we're going to bring incoming power in through all those different safety switches. <clears throat> and you'll see the way it's drawn that there are two transformers drawn outside of the ZVC panel. That's the way the schematic is. But those two transformers are in the panel. And the reason why we have two transformers is we split the load. So one transformer is taking, fair, taking care of the first three zones. The other transformer will take care of the next three zones. I can have my thermostats and or aquastats at the top. You see the priority switch. On the bottom, you can see I can do a two-wire, three-terminal, or four-wire zone valve. Now, you may be saying, where do I ever use a two-wire zone valve? Well, if you do radiant systems and you do actuators across a manifold, those actuators nowadays are just a motor, and they're two-wire. So if you wire them to my ZVC panel, you would put a jumper across three and four to tell the panel that the end switch is closed. 
If you're using the Takeo 570 series, I don't have to worry about dealing with four wires. I just take wire, I take wire from terminal one to terminal one, two to two, three to three, that's done. If it's a four wire valve, two yellows go to one and two, two reds go to three and four. If it's the Takeo Zone Sentry, it is 24 volt terminal goes to wires, one, a terminal one and two, and the, the end switch terminal goes to wire, go to terminal three and four. Rob, hit the buttons, please. So here you can see we're bringing power into those dry contacts on the lower left. And here I have the opportunity to drive again up to three circulators, a system pump, one more button please Rob, a domestic pump and also the space heating or secondary pump. So I can do a lot with these panels. And again, I can turn, we have the ability to take these out to 120 zones. So th these are not just for small jobs, they're for large jobs too. And there's a lot of times we will use SR and ZVCs together because I may have a large radiant job where I'll have multiple zones, but I need a circulator per multiple zone. So let's say I've got three good size zones and I'm going to have a circulator for them. I could use a ZVC panel and an SR panel and make the wiring a lot easier. All right, Rob, next sequence, please. All right, so now if we're gonna do any larger zoning, if I'm gonna go past either four or six zones, we use our expandable panels. So the same sequence of bringing power in, going through all of our different switches. Keep hitting it, Bob, uh, Rob, there's plenty of wiring here. All right, you can see where our thermostats are gonna go and or aquastats. Uh, this is, uh, go back up, please. These are where our, our uh, these are expandable for uh, pumps. We also have the same thing for zone valves. And what's the difference here? We do give you a bunch of dip switches on each of these expandable panels. So when you order these, these are SR506, 504, EXP for expandable. If they were zone valve expandable, it'd be a ZVC 404 or 406 EXP. The dip switches are there because you have to set up which one will be the primary box. We say master, which I know we're not supposed to say anymore, but that would be your primary box. And then we have a dip switch to make the secondary box the secondary. One has to be the primary, one has to be the secondary. We have the ability to add outdoor reset to these things. We have the ability to stage two boilers if we want to. And we also have an expansion block, which would be A, B, and C. So A terminal to A, B to B, C to C, and we give you two end switches out of all of our expandables to go to our boiler because we have one that's just going to fire the boiler and one that's just exclusively for domestic hot water to tell the boiler, especially if it was a condensing boiler, to high fire for a domestic call. So even though you've got a lot of control now on a lot of these uh, condensing boilers, you still may have a pretty busy project on the space heating and the domestic side, and these boxes can really help you out. All right, next slide, please. So I've been nonstop talking. We are done, but here I want you to really pay attention to this. So either on your downloads, download the PDF for our, our uh, Takeo uh, Advanced Wiring Guide. Also the notes that we gave you from today's PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation, but I want you to take advantage of these two books because this whole presentation would base, was based off these two books by Carol Fay, who for years, 20 plus years, was a, a, a tech, a high-end tech for Honeywell. And she wrote two great books. One's called Quick and Basic Electricity, and the other one is called Quick and Basic Troubleshooting. These are very small, thin books. Go to Amazon. I think the last time I purchased them was like 20 bucks for two, and she threw in a whole house wiring book. Excellent books, very quick reads, very, very simple explanation, and that will help reinforce what we went through today. So if this was new for you, you do need to practice. You do need to look at this stuff. You do need to think about it over a course of a week so it becomes ingrained. Okay, get those books, read those books, and if you got questions, you can always email us. You can email me at jadapalma at walesdarby.com. You can email Rob at rclemens at walesdarby.com, and we'll help you out as best you can. 
So, Robbie, any other questions we didn't answer? No, that's, uh, I think that's it. All right. So I thank you. Thank you for hanging in with us with our little technical glitches, but it was a pleasure to do this. Come next week, we will do today's Hydronic System Solutions on October 12th. And October 12th is a big day at Wales Derby because here we'll be doing the hydronics class and over in our New York location. So if you're on the New York side, we're having a hydronics day where we will have a whole bunch of our manufacturers there with product. We have a couple of uh, demonstration trailers that will be our, at our New York office. There'll be training classes there. You can meet people from Space Pack, NTI, Electro. Gosh, who else? Did I say Taco? Taco, Upanor, all right? So we have factory people there. We'll have training classes there, and you can touch, see, and get educated. So it's big day next week. Sign up for our webinar, and again, if you're in New York, go take the webinar and then go to the show. It'll be well worth it. So thank you very much today. We'll see you next time.